In the aftermath of Leuctra, Thebes sought more aid from other Greek cities for an invasion of the Peloponnesus. A herald was dispatched to Athens, but the Athenians refused to let the messenger speak. Next, the Thebans looked to Jason of Phari, who was the ruler of Thessaly. Jason assembled a sizable force and arrived in Boeotia. However, Jason convinced the Thebans not to invade Sparta. Likewise, he convinced the Spartans not to launch another invasion of Boeotia. During this time, it became apparent that Jason was a central figure in Greece, as both sides looked to him to procure a lasting truce. It is clear that Jason must have possessed a threat to all of Greece, especially given how Thebes and Sparta heeded his advice. Whether or not Jason would have overrun Greece in the same way Philip did a few decades later is unclear, because Jason was assassinated a short time later at the Pythian Games in 370 BC. The Olympic Games were not the only games held in ancient Greece. There were three other Hellenic Games, and they were all very important. One of these events, the Pythian Games, was held right at Delphi. It was on this spot that the god Apollo had, according to legend, killed the mythical serpent called the Python. However, Zeus was outraged, and Apollo, in an attempt to appease Zeus, created the Pythian Games. Unlike other games, the Pythian Games held musical contests in addition to athletic contests. So it was sort of the best of both worlds. Similar to today, many ancient rulers and cities used athletic events to project their power. Therefore, Jason decided to run the games himself. Jason even issued a proclamation that a golden wreath would be given to the city that produced the finest bull to head the procession in honor of Apollo. But Jason's moment of glory came to a quick and bitter end when, at an event, seven men rushed Jason and stabbed him multiple times. Jason was dead before his bodyguard could even arrive. Xenophon writes, quote, The whole incident proves clearly that the Hellenes stood in much alarm of Jason. They looked upon him as a tyrant in embryo. All right, so with Jason out of the way, Athens was anxious to maintain the previous peace treaty that had been in place before the Battle of Leuctra. This wasn't really a new treaty, it just reaffirmed the contents of the old treaty, before the Battle of Leuctra. The key point here was that, quote, all city-states, great and small alike, were to be independent. You will remember that Sparta never believed that the independent clause applied to the city-states in the Peloponnesian League. But now that the Spartans were in a weakened state after the disaster at Leuctra, several cities in Arcadia, the province just in the north of Laconia, decided to seek their independence. The ringleader of these Arcadian cities was the town of Montania. Montania passed a decree to formally leave the Peloponnesian League and become an independent city-state. And of course, they had the peace treaty now backing them up. To hammer home the point, the Montanians decided to build walled fortifications around their city in case Sparta decided to launch an attack. Well, as you can probably guess, this did not go over well in Sparta. Sparta was worried that the rest of Arcadia would revolt and form their own league, the Arcadian League. The Spartans were anxious to resolve this before the Arcadian League could be formed. Sparta sent Agesilaus as an envoy to Montania, because Agesilaus had an ancestral relationship with the city of Montania. So the thought here was that he just might be able to convince the Montanians to remain in the Peloponnesian League. Agesilaus politely asked the Montanians to at least temporarily halt their work on the defensive walls, and that the fortifications could only be built after receiving permission from Sparta. The magistrates at Montania stated flatly they could do nothing since the decree to build the wall had been passed by the entire city. This created a serious dilemma for Sparta, since technically the Montanians had every right to build the wall. Xenophon states, quote, the peace was based upon the principle of autonomy, and so just what the Spartans feared would happen, happened. Other Arcadian cities began to revolt. The most notable was Tegea. Now this was a problem for Sparta because Tegea was situated directly on the road to Sparta, and therefore the town was vital to Sparta's overall defense strategy. You'll remember a long time ago when I did that video on Sparta, I mentioned that the Peloponnesian League was really a gigantic buffer zone, a buffer to protect Sparta from outside threats. And if that buffer was eliminated, Sparta itself would be directly exposed. Now, in Tegea, there was a bitter dispute about which side to choose. One party supported remaining with Sparta, and another party proposed leaving the Peloponnesian League altogether, and forming a confederation with the other Arcadian cities, including Montania. When the negotiations broke down, an all-out civil war broke out with the pro-Spartan party, forcing the anti-Spartan party to retreat to the walls that faced Montania. 
the anti-Spartan party immediately dispatched messengers to Montania requesting assistance. The Montanians responded and advanced upon Tegea, and the gates were swung open for the Montanians to enter. Facing overwhelming odds, the pro-Spartan party was forced into a headlong retreat and took sanctuary in the Temple of Artemis, outside of Tegea. The pro-Spartans were quickly surrounded by the Montanians and the anti-Spartan party. They were forced to surrender and immediately executed. The rest of the pro-Spartans were forced to flee to Sparta with the terrible news. Sparta immediately accused Montania of violating the peace treaty when they marched upon Tegea. Thus, the Spartans determined they were bound by their oaths to attack Montania for violating the terms of the peace treaty. Agesilaus was chosen to lead the army. Meanwhile, the Arcadians were forming up near Montania. Messengers were also dispatched to Thebes requesting assistance. And for Thebes, this was a golden opportunity to launch an attack against Sparta. In Sparta, Agesilaus set out with his army. He made the usual sacrifices to the gods. After receiving favorable signs, Agesilaus marched into Arcadia. Here, Agesilaus waited for mercenary reinforcements, but soon he received the news that Sparta's mercenaries had been defeated by the Montanians. After this victory, the Montanians retreated back to their city. Agesilaus finally reached Tegea, where he made camp. The next day, he moved into Montanian territory. However, the main Arcadian force was able to sneak right past Agesilaus and into Tegean territory. The Montanian army, however, remained in their city. With the enemy force now divided into two, Agesilaus was advised to attack one of these forces separately. Agesilaus, however, decided to wait to see what transpired. He made several more sacrifices to the gods and ravaged the Arcadian countryside. Meanwhile, the Montanians were anxious to fight the Spartans, but eventually decided it would be wiser to wait until the Thebans arrived. At this point, Agesilaus, having ravaged enough of the Arcadian countryside, retreated back to Laconian soil where he disbanded the army. The Arcadian confederation, realizing that the Spartans were no longer in Arcadia, seized Heria. This had been one of the few towns in Arcadia that remained loyal to Sparta. The Arcadians were bolstered even further when the Thebans, led by Epaminondas, arrived at Mountania. Other Arcadian cities, sensing victory, soon joined this massive confederation, bringing the overall manpower to perhaps 70,000, a size that Sparta simply could not hope to defeat in the open field. While in Arcadia, Epaminondas pushed the Arcadians not only to form their own league, but he also convinced them to build a new city called Megalopolis. This would serve as the capital of the newly formed Arcadian League. It would maintain a garrison and federal buildings, but you only needed to look at a map to see the real intention here. It was situated near Laconia's border, so it would act as a powerful check against future Spartan aggression. With the situation stabilized, the Thebans were content that Arcadia was safe, especially since the Spartan army was no longer ravaging Arcadian territory and the Arcadians had formed a league. But the Arcadians pleaded with the Thebans to invade Laconian territory especially with the huge army in perfect position to launch a strike. Epaminondas convinced the other skeptical Theban generals to do just that. After all, this was a chance to deal a major blow to Sparta's reputation. And so the massive force moved south into Laconia. This was an unprecedented event in the history of ancient Greece. The fact that an invading force could actually step foot on Laconian soil. The allied army under the direction of Epaminondas safely kept the Eurotas River on their right. Sparta, of course, was located on the western bank of the river. As this invading army moved south down the Eurotas, they pillaged and burned everything in their path. Eventually, they moved to within sight of Sparta itself. Despite the huge advantage in numbers, Epaminondas had little interest in fighting inside Sparta. Fighting in close quarters would have given the Spartans a huge advantage since the Spartans were still the best in the world in close quarters combat. Likewise, the Spartans refused to march out in the open field against the Thebans. And so the invading coalition decided not to cross the Eurotas River and continued on pillaging the surrounding countryside. With the enemy operating freely in Laconia, the Spartans decided to resort to more drastic measures. Sparta passed a decree that any helot could gain his freedom if they fought in the war against Thebes and the Arcadians. According to Xenophon, nearly 6,000 helots signed up for this cause. The Thebans finally did cross the Eratus River and made an approach to Amaklai, a city located just to the south of Sparta. By this point, the Spartans had received reinforcements from cities still loyal to the Peloponnesian League, and so Epaminondas made the decision not to storm the city and to continue on pillaging. With the Spartans reinforced, the Thebans erred on the side of caution and decided to construct a stockade made up of the fruit trees they had just cut down. But the Arcadians, fresh with renewed confidence, continued on ravaging Laconian territory. As a result, the Arcadians became more and more careless. 
This gave the Spartans an opportunity to launch a surprise attack against the overconfident Arcadians. The Theban army, according to Xenophon, did nothing to hinder the Spartans and remained in their camp. Eventually, all armies returned to their respective camps. The Thebans and Arcadians eventually broke camp and marched even further south, to the unwalled city of Githium. This was Sparta's all-important port city. The Thebans and Arcadians laid siege to it for three brutal days, and actually briefly captured the port. But the Spartans were able to take it back a few days later. The news of these ongoing events in Laconia disturbed the Athenians, who were not anxious to see Sparta destroyed especially since this would have greatly benefited the increasingly powerful Thebes. Therefore, the Athenians decided to let Spartan envoys speak on the assembly floor. The Spartans reminded the Athenians that after the Peloponnesian War, it was the Thebans who had wished to raise Athens, but that it was the Spartans who made the ultimate decision to save Athens. Although there was some initial dissension, the Athenian assembly decided to send military aid to Sparta. Ephicrates was selected to lead the Athenian task force. Meanwhile, in Laconia, the Arcadians and Argives retreated back to their respective territories. The main reason being that their lands bordered Laconia, and so it was their lands that were under direct threat of a Spartan counterattack. The Thebans, too, were also anxious to leave, especially since the winter had arrived and they were not about to invade Sparta itself. Ephicrates finally did arrive, but failed to prevent the Thebans from retreating out of Laconia, an action that Xenophon criticizes. He blamed Ephicrates for wasting unnecessary time before moving his force into Laconia. I think what happened here is Ephicrates was not as sympathetic to the Spartan cause as the Athenian assembly had been. After all, it had been Ephicrates who had fought so hard against the Spartans during the Corinthian War. Epaminondas decided to increase the pressure on Sparta, and instead of returning to Arcadia, he marched into Messenia. This was, of course, the all-important region that Sparta relied on for food and resources. But to the Helots, who were so long servants to Sparta, they saw Epaminondas as their liberator and welcomed him with open arms. Epaminondas immediately freed the Helots in Messenia. Even worse for Sparta, Epaminondas established yet another new city, Messene, which would become the new capital of Messenia. Actually, it was rebuilt on the nearly impenetrable Mount Etomi. These fortifications were the strongest in Greece, and Messenia, similar to Arcadia, invoked the autonomy clause of the treaty, and so Epaminondas had freed two of the major territories that bordered Laconia. Although Epaminondas never captured Sparta, he indirectly did untold amounts of damage to Sparta's grip on the Peloponnesus. But perhaps no other action was more damaging to Sparta than the loss of Messenia. This would make it practically impossible for the Spartans to rebuild their army, since it relied so heavily on the output of the Helots in Messenia. So Epaminondas quite clearly favored an indirect approach in the war against Sparta, and so cutting off Sparta from her resources was the master plan. When Epaminondas returned to Thebes, he was actually brought up on charges that he had illegally extended the terms of other Theban generals. This was necessary since the Theban army had been deep inside Laconian territory. The charges, however, had been arranged by his political enemies, and they were quickly dropped, and Epaminondas was re-elected as general for the year 369 BC.